I'm so happy to be here today with Dr. Michael Martin and Dr. Michael Claridge. I've been wanting to get the two Michaels together for a while. As you all know, I like to do this kind of interesting mashup where I put together two people who maybe from the outside, you might not know why they should talk to each other, but, but um, because I've been following both of them for quite some time, I think it will be a really great conversation. So let me tell you just a little bit about each one of these gentlemen. Um, Dr. Michael Claridge is, received his PhD in physics from Brandeis. And at that time he was studying biological and statistical behavior of proteins. But before that, he had spent some years studying binary pulsars at the Arecibo Radio Telescope. He's also given lectures in fractional calculus, fractals, um, and chaotic systems, as well as public talks on relativity and dimensions transformation in supernova and metamorphosis in biology. <clears throat> Dr. Claridge is currently a scientist with the Sapphire Project. What uniquely triggered me to contact him this time is that he had just done a Substack article on a book by Rudolf Hauschka. And I thought that book would be something that Dr. Michael Martin would be very interested in hearing about. So Dr. Michael Martin is a um, very interesting um, polymath, I guess I would say, <laughs> poet, um, author, uh, has been a college professor in literature and a biodynamic farmer, as well as a musician. He's written lots of wonderful books. Um, one that I've part read partly is The Submerged Reality. He's also written Sophia in Exile and The Chemical Wedding of Christian Rosenkreutz, together with a number of other books, which I'll all list in the, in the description section. And he is the editor, I believe, of Jesus, the Imagination, a journal of right. spiritual revolution. So, um, which has some of your artwork on the last issue. <laughs> uh -huh. Well, that was, cover. it was very fun getting that in the mail and seeing that. Yeah. <laughs> um, I appreciate you. I appreciate you seeing that and taking the time to put that Let's together. Let's show the people. There it is oh, right there. It there. Oh, there wow. Is. Look at that, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Turned out really nice. So um, I pulled up this book by Rudolf Hauschka, and since I couldn't, I didn't have time to get a copy of it, I just pulled up as many pages as I could get from Amazon. And uh, mm -hmm. so I'm going to start out with a couple of quotes here that the two of you can maybe talk about a bit. But maybe before I get to that, um, Michael Claridge, maybe you could tell us why you were interested in that book and what got you to write a review of it. Boy. What stuck out to you? Yeah. Uh, well, I stumbled on it because of ongoing searches into uh, elemental transmutation, nuclear transmutation out, that takes place outside of the realm of nuclear power plants. And uh, it's, it's, it's knowledge that has risen and surfaced literally through the centuries that, uh, that elemental transmutations are happening. It's, it's a natural process. They're hap it's happening everywhere. Um, and so it, as part of that, I came, it came across the name. And he had done experiments uh, with plants, showing that some plants can produce calcium, for example, is a classic one. Uh, and I'd never heard his name before. And so I just, I, that was, that was the reason why I went and got the book. And then I opened the book and I was like, oh my goodness, right? This guy is really, he's, I, I don't, one, I don't know where he got all, you know, his training. Uh, he clearly was influenced by Steiner, but it wasn't like he was going to all the Steiner lectures. Uh, and he just was, had this, he has this vision of uh, the, the direction that science needs to go in to be useful, to be uh, resurrected, so to speak. Because he could see in the 40s, the 30s and 40s, that science was becoming more and more dead. It was studying more and more dead things, and it was explaining everything through, de through dead matter and dead processes. And, 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 and so he had this other vision of we need to reconnect uh, to a living universe that, that goes up through levels, through the earth, through the sun, through the galaxy, et cetera. So I was like, wow, all right. I got to, you know, I found somebody I can sink my teeth into. Yeah, so let me just read a quote from the, 
from the uh, introduction of his book, The Nature of Substance, Spirit and Matter. Um, the, and he's speaking of himself in the third person, but I think he, I think he is the one who's writing <laughs> this. He says, uh, the author has been at work for decades on experiments which have yielded a new perspective on the nature of matter and hence suggest a new orientation of the sciences. But eyes that educate themselves to qualitative seeing need no experiments to view long familiar phenomena in a fresh light. We need to overcome a materialistic view of nature and practice a way of looking that is an active thinking into things, not merely a recording of measure, weight, and number followed by explanations that imprison facts in a rigid world of hypotheses and theory. And uh, that made me think of you, Michael Martin, when you talked about, I asked you once to explain the difference between organic and biodynamic farming. Mm -hmm. and I wonder if you could do that for us now, because I think that's uh, <laughs> it's such an interesting difference. Uh, well, the short answer is biodynamic is organic on acid, but uh, the biodynamic looks at the farm as an entity, as as one as a being. They call it the being of the farm. So ideally, on an organic farm, you would have or a biodynamic farm, you wouldn't bring any inputs from off the farm, and and you know everything you use on the farm would be created on the farm. So now my farm is not big enough to do that. So if I had enough uh, space to to get to do pasturage and to do field crops. So if I, if I had 40 more acres, I could do that. Um, so you'd, but, but you do with, you know, you do what you can, where you can. And, but also it's the other dimension of biodynamic farming. It's, it's kind of uh, where biodynamic farm, where, where farming hits uh, homeopathy. Mm -hmm. And this is, this, you can see there's a connection to Hauschka right there. And, so what we do in biodynamic farming is we use these various preparations made from different substances. Usually it's a, a, a substance from the vegetable kingdom um, in kind of relationship to something from the animal kingdom. So for instance, and they all sound all very kind of witchcrafty when you describe it. So the most important one is uh, the biodynamic BD500 or the horn manure preparation, which is um, what we do is we uh, take fresh cow, cow manure, and this is like in September, October, and st stuff it into cow horns. Uh, it has to be a cow horn, not a bull horn, and buried over the, the winter months, and it becomes a kind of uh, homeopathic compost. And which is, you know, so what happens and then when you take it out then you stir a handful or, or more in, in a pail of water for an hour and you keep, you, you make different, like, like you do in homeopathy, you triturate it. So you, you create a kind of a vortex and go the opposite way. And it's kind of a way to enliven the water. But, and then that is sprayed on the soil. And there are other ones as well. I'm going to get all, give all the, all the things we do, but and the thing is, so um, there was, a, I, I've been doing this for decades, but there was a, about five years or so where I wasn't doing it at all. I was kind of on strike after I left being a Waldorf teacher. <laughs> I, was, I was not having anything to do with those guys anymore. And then I decided after maybe it was three or four years on this farm we used to have, I said, I'm going to go back to using the preps. And right away, you could see the, a, a change and, and I'm in this farm we're at now where we've been here going on eight years now you can there's a huge difference in the quality of the soil in the quality of everything you know the, the plants this last year was our seventh year and you know they they always say that on the seventh year and about it working biodynamically is when you can really see the results which is we really saw the results because we had very little in the way of insect damage or 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 molds or any there were you know fungus so you, you can really tell because everything was in balance was that from that just the one change of the horn manure thing or did you well there's a couple other the things hole. there are there are compost preparations too and there's another uh, horn preparation made from with uh, 
a powdered quartz that, that's used as a foliar spray. Um, and so, so, but, but it, it's, it's not just with that and it's not like it's a magic potion, right? Mm -hmm. But it's also the, the way you treat, treat the animals in the soil. And so we have a cow, we have two cows actually. And, uh, you know, so we're doing what you can call, uh, you know, kind of sound practices that don't involve introduction of foreign substances or cer certainly, uh, like petrochemicals that you'd never find that uh, uh, biodynamic farm, and 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 you're working to create a harmony is what the whole idea is. You do all these things, you work with with the animals, you, you know. So in a biodynamic farm, an ideal bi biodynamic farm has both animals and plants and pasturage and has water and woods. So it's it's really a, a um a microcosm. Mm -hmm. And what happens, and this is, I've seen it happen over and over again, and people I know who are biodynamic farmers have been doing it longer than I have, could attest to this, is it builds uh, a balance with nature. And this is why I think when I, I mentioned with the last year in insects and fungal problems, which we didn't have any, and we have every other year for mm -hmm. one way or another. And it's because the there's there's a, been a balance achieved between you know the wild things of nature like the insects and the domesticated parts of wild plants domesticated plants so so that's that's part of it i mean and i and i think you know going back to to what you read karen uh from haushka i mean what biodynamic farming is really grounded in a kind of Gertian scientific approach to things, which is what Hauschka was doing, and mm -hmm. and when you what you said was it sounded it, it was it was a uh, in a way uh, Goethe filtered through Steiner, coming through the mouth of of Hauschka, because this whole approach to science that the, all three of those men were uh, encouraging was was not the kind of uh, rape and pillage model of that often is the scientific revolution, right? Where if you read, um, you know, the the literature from the 17th century, and this is how I got into it. My my, degree, my doctorate is in 17th century English literature, and I was at first I was studying uh, mysticism and poetry, but half the mystics and poets that I studied were part time alchemists, you know. So you you read their approach um, to the natural world into creation and then after the scientific revolution much of the the literature speaks of not just exploiting nature but torturing nature to make her give us up her secrets mm -hmm. so it's all, it almost like the language of rape right and, and conquest mm -hmm. whereas goethe was he called his uh approach reverence right if we listen to nature this is what he said this is what Hauschka says what steiner says we need to learn how to listen to nature and so this is where uh, Gertian phenomenology starts. And I think, and, and this is, you know, before, I don't want to hog all the, suck all the air out of the room, but when I was studying all these figures in, from the 17th century, in particular, uh, Henry and Thomas Vaughan, Henry Vaughan was a metaphysical poet and his brother, his twin brother Thomas was an Anglican priest and alchemist, as well as, uh, uh, well, I uh, Sir Kenelm Digby, who was an alchemist and you know a polit Catholic apologist, they when when they looked at the the scientific revolution, they saw what was happening. They they saw it was dangerous because what was happening after Francis Bacon and Descartes is science was becoming materialistic and ignoring any possibility of the realm of the spirit we could say being involved in any processes you know so for in a way so i've described them they were kind of traditionalists you know <laughs> so, so the the scientific revolution comes in here and we're just going to look at quantify quantification now and they're like what about quality we're not doing quality we're just doing quantification and they thought that was a, a, a wrong-headed idea and I've often said on my own podcast, which the Regeneration podcast, and in my books, what would have happened had 
the science is not taking that turn into a materialistic, you know, scientific materialism with the with the uh, the scientific revolution. And what if they they continued or not really continued, but developed that aspect that he was talking. They were talking about the 17th century, and I think you see part of this come in. In I'm, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna lecture a physicist about physics, but I think you see some of this come back in the 20th century with quantum mechanics, where the and and the ideas right now with with consciousness. What is consciousness, and where is it? Right. And and I saw your interview with with Michael Karen. And that, that was seemed to be one of the things you were talking about, what and you know, how our perceptions and our assumptions color what we see. Well, so I want to bring Michael Claridge back into this with this idea of how to do experiments. And Michael, you <laughs> recently did an experiment regarding color and light. And I thought it was so interesting the way you approached that experiment. Do, do you want to talk about that a little bit? Was this the one with the with the, the yellow? Ink? The one with the yellow. With the ink. Yes, uh-huh. Yeah. Well, um, sh yes, I will. And I think we should also come back to the statement you read from the book mm -hmm. with the quali qualitative and, and qualitative seeing and thinking into was the translation of a, a German. I think we yeah. should go back to that because I think for most of us, or most people probably listening to this uh, discussion, those are going to be pretty confusing terms. And I think it could really be good if we go back to that. But I can talk oh, about the well. The go back thing. to the, you go back to that, and then we can go into the other experiment. That's okay. Fine. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. So may, maybe just read the the, the segment again. Sure. Um, eyes that educate themselves to qualitative seeing need no experiments to view long familiar phenomena in a fresh light. Overcoming a materialistic view of nature means learning to see phenomena freshly, practicing a way of looking that is an active thinking into things, not merely a recording of measure, weight, and number, followed by explanations that imprison facts in a rigid world of hypothesis and theory. Wow, mouthful. That's a mouthful. I mean, I, 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 I'd like to hear what you have to say, Michael and Karen, about quality because I found myself getting tripped up with that trying to explain it to somebody and I'm like you know what I don't think I I, I but I won't talk about the act of seeing into um it is it is a very different relationship to the world the the the, the, the one of the things that I you know I think has gone off is we we start trusting only trusting the instruments that are made of glass and metal and and whatnot and um and kind of the model of those is that they're passive that it's just photographic film and, you know, the impression just hits and you're not doing anything, you know, no one's interfering. We're just, we're just, you know, and sure, that's a way to, to take in the world, right? Uh, but, but to take it in, in an active way, you know, which most scientific instruments cannot do, uh, that would be great if we could bring that back in to the sciences. And I think most, most experimenters who have good intuition, they're doing that, right? When they, when they look at something, the, there's, some, the, there's an activity going on inside that's seeing into whatever it is they're looking at and is, is, is like directly perceiving something. Um, and intuition is, is an okay word for it. Uh, but it has to do like with some kind of a interpenetration of me looking at the whatever, uh, which an instrument, like I said, repeating myself, it's really hard to make instruments do that. Well, I mean, it's you, what you just did right there was explain in a different way what Hausch goes on to say, because he, he starts talking about art and he says an artist who merely copies nature, no matter how perfectly is a technician, not an artist. Mm -hmm. Genuine artists live in the objects of their study and create them freshly and revealingly again. This type of creating calls for something that goes beyond trained hand or eye. It requires vivid activity of soul and spirit. Mm -hmm. So he penetrates ever closer to the heart of truth out of which the reality of outer nature also sprang. 
Is there any reason why science could not benefit equally from this artistic <laughs> approach to facts? Yeah. Yeah, it would satisfy the justified demand of the human spirit for creativity in all its functioning. Mm -hmm. And that really res resonated with me because I've been, I've been teaching seminars on that for like 20 years on how, mm -hmm. um, not many seminars, but I've, I've put together the material a long time ago and I've done as many as I've had the opportunity to because to me, the idea that each one of us is a completely unique individual, not only in our DNA and our bodily structure and everything, but because my experiences are so differentiated from anybody else's, as are yours, anything that you learn or hear it filters through all of your own experiences. So when it comes back out from you, it's also being filtered through all of those experiences, which means you have a completely unique perspective on every single thing that you do. And the world needs all of the unique perspectives working together. And the only way that's ever going to happen is through people's creative efforts, because not everybody can write books or have YouTube channels or philosophize or paint pictures. But everybody has some creative outlet that they, in which they can express that individual person that they are. And well, I, uh, I think what that is, though, and I think that's what Hausch is describing there. And this is and this was a kind of a revelation to me in graduate school when I realized what I was doing. And in and, and this idea that from again from Goethe to let phenomenon speak. To let because it's not just a, a speaking, but it's it's a revelation, you know. And I think people have this experience. Um, it, it, I personally, I have it definitely in farming, but even more so in writing poetry and music, when playing music, where something is revealed, you know, and it, and you re, and you say, wow, where did that come from? But it it, it happens because. And it's an interesting thing, right? And I think as a scientist, you know, you're, you're trained to, to do, to observe certain protocols or have certain practices, but, and the same thing with being a musician or a poet, but there's, there's a place where, where we, where it becomes contemplation, where there's thought stops being part of it and being present to the pho phenomenon is what allows it to speak. And and I think people people do this with scripture as well. I mean, I think, you know, kind of a classic example is, you know, you've read the same line in scripture a gazillion times, but that one time you read it in the right presence and all of a sudden the world opens up. And there's a, there's an example of this from uh, one of my favorite philosophers, Simone Weil, who uh, was, was uh very sickly and afflicted by migraines. And what happened is she, a friend of hers gave her a book of the metaphysical poets. And this is how I ran into it. And she loved this poem by George Herbert so much. It was Love Three, it's called. And she translated it into French. And whenever she felt a migraine coming on, she would just start to repeat this poem to herself just to kind of way to relax herself but she wrote in a letter to a priest that uh you know at first you know this was just a, a nice way to relax when I was you know felt a headache coming on but after a while it took on the virtue of a prayer and then finally it was during these one of these recitations and where she says where Christ himself came down and took possession of me and I think that's what happens very often, I think this is not an uncommon experience. Maybe we don't say it's Christ that came down and took possession of me, but we all, I think, have those moments where the transcendent in the imminent transcendent reveals itself to us. Mm -hmm. Right. And I, th I know it happens in the sciences. Well, yeah, I mean, I'd love, I, 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 push this all the time to people and I don't know how many people have ever followed through on my recommendation but there's a terrific lecture by a physicist named Nima Arkani Hamed and I always mess up the name of it it's the the fundal, fundamental morality of physics I think is the name of it could be the morality of fundamental uh -huh. physics or the fundamental morality of physics anyway it's a lecture that's on YouTube 
And in it, he talks about the nature of doing physics that results in truth. And that once a truth is found, it becomes like, a, and one of the examples he used was the, the uh, Newtonian physics, that it creates this like crystalline structure in the world that's real and exists and is going to be true forever. And even though it, some people may say it's superseded by Einsteinian physics, Einsteinian physics is, a, is another mountain further on and maybe higher, but when you look from the mountain of Einstein physics, you're looking back and you can still see clearly the mm -hmm. mountain of Newtonian physics. It okay. hasn't changed. It's still as true as it was mm -hmm. when it was first um, reiterated. Yeah. And so he talks about how a, a scientist, a physicist must be absolutely a person of integrity so that when they find a piece of truth, it actually is true. If they start um, just trying to be famous or trying to um, manipulate facts in order to get grants or something like that, it, it completely corrupts the whole industry. And uh, it's, a, it's a brilliant lecture, the way he put it together. And rather courageous for a, a particle physicist in this day and age to be talking about things like yeah. that. Because he's an atheist, he comes out and says, I'm an absolute atheist. And yet there is this perfect truth towards yeah. which we are all headed. We're mm -hmm. all moving towards this perfect truth that's out there. And, and along the way, we find little mountains, but we're not there yet. And we, you know, we can never get there. So. I was thinking more about the, a certain sort of active thinking into objects. And he ties it right in with the soul and the spirit. Uh, so in one sense, his whole presentation assumes that. He's not trying to prove to you that you have a soul and a spirit. It's just part of, uh, and you know, this, this uh, and, and you're never, the, the, the matter, the matter is never going, is never going to know the spirit, I don't think, or never gonna know the soul. Uh, but, if I I'm sitting here in this wonderful meat spacesuit, right? But if there's if there's if I'm have my soul somehow more active, and then I look at that plant, and I bring that into the into the matter of that plant, then maybe I can see past the matter of that plant to something invisible, some whatever the comparable thing for the soul of a plant would be, and then there there can be that connection at that level between two creatures that are made of carbon and oxygen, but also have these other levels inside of them. Well, I, I mean, one of the things you talked about from the Hauschka book was this idea that um, plants can transmute things that are not calcium into calcium because right. they need calcium. Right. And I read recently an article about the community that exists under the soil amongst various plants of different species, maybe species is the wrong word, varieties, different varieties of plants and trees, that if one variety has enough of some nutrient and doesn't need it anymore, it yes. can offload that down into the root system. And then the plants that need it, yeah. that are not that particular tree, are able to get that nutrient out of the soil for their needs. And so um, who's to say what soul and spirit is? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, and there's the, some, the, there's something deeper there that, that that kind of community exists yeah. um, in the plant world. Yeah. Yeah. So d you said you started looking for things about transmutation and that's what bumped you into Hauschka. Why were you looking for things about transmutation? Isn't that dangerous? <laughs> right. Well, that's, that's what the, the Sapphire experiment, that's one of the areas we are experimenting on. Okay. So, well, just for those who don't know, what, give us, what? give us a two minute on the Sapphire experiment. <laughs> it, it started off as a privately funded astronomy experiment. So I was super lucky to be probably one of the only, if not the only privately funded astronomy project um, to see, 
to see if we could do laboratory work that would um, support the, the, the theory that stars are electrical, that, that when we, that the, the, a star is primarily an electrical discharge, which is very different from what, you know, if you open a textbook and what is a star, you will not see that. You will see that a star is a gravitationally collapsed bit of hot gas, which it, it, in its center uh, is so hot and so dense that nuclear fusion starts taking place. And there's this other model, uh, an electrical cosmological model, which says, no, actually the star is transforming electrical energy and that electrical energy is coming from outside of itself. So stars are not lonely, isolated uh, creatures that are going to use up their own personal fuel and then die a cold death. Every star is actually connected and getting energy from its surroundings, and that energy is, is electrical. So the SAFIRE experiment was, okay, guys, can you do any laboratory experiments that will prove any of this theory, or, or not prove, so kind of the wrong word, that'll give um, credence or give evidence and support of any of this theory of electric stars. And in the course of all that, one of the things that we found is that we could, uh, uh, we, we, we were creating elements in our experimental chambers that we didn't start with. Um, uh, and so that's also in the, that's, that's part of the nature of stars. At least it's part of the classical training that stars, that stars produce all of the elements out of hydrogen, right? They uh, and it's, it's also part of an electrical model that uh, you, through electricity, you can change elements into each other. And so that's been a thread in our in our in our studies is uh, is is that transmutation through through electricity. Well, it's so interesting that you're thinking about transmutation through electricity, and then you stumble into Rudolf Hauschka, yeah. who's talking about um, biological life. And one of the things that was in the the book review that you wrote was about the molecular compound where they developed an artificial, a synthetic compound that was uh, the same compound as something that was used for um, plant food. Yeah. And then they tried to use that synthetic compound to feed the plants and it was completely identical in terms of the molecular structure. Right. But it did not feed the plants. I thought that was super interesting. Could I just you love talk that. about that a little bit. Yeah, and Michael, you probably can talk more directly to this because I don't have the experience of it. But but it comes down to the like, what's the model of an atom? And so you know, if you go to school, you you get told that you know this. Uh, uh, boop, 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 that that is water, right? That we can draw it, and it's that's all it is. That's all you need to know right there. And it doesn't matter where the water comes from. It doesn't matter where it's going. You know, it's just water is water is water because that's water, right? And so this was in the 30s when the petrochemical industries were starting to be used to create all kinds of things, including things like fertilizers and drugs mm -hmm. and whatnot. And so I just love this guy. So he's like, okay, well, let's, let's test this, right? Uh, I'll take some food that I know is, is very healthy for plants. I know what the chemical structure it is. I'll ask my buddies down the road there at the bow, uh, whatever, Bausch uh, chemical plant to make the same thing for me. And I'll <laughs> feed both of those to the plants and we'll see whether or not they're the same. And as you said, they weren't the same, that the, the naturally occurring version of it fed the plants, the petrochemical version did not. In fact, I think of the experiment I'm remembering, it's as if you gave them nothing. It just, it had absolutely zero effect on them if I remember it correctly. Uh, yeah, and so that he, and you know, as as a brave scientist, he's like, well, this basically proves that there's something wrong with this, right? Mm -hmm. This is an incomplete model, and we need to expand our model if we're ever, ever going to get anywhere in this endeavor. And I, Michael, do you have any uh, experiences along those lines where it, it it totally depends upon like where that water came from or something like that? Oh yeah, they're a big difference. I mean, for instance, uh, we're we're fortunate where we live. We have a a really clean well. We don't even, we don't even need a filter on our well to drink the water, which is rare. And uh, 
but but comparing that to city water for instance which is not it's dead water in, in a way um and it reminds me you're reminding me of uh my friend Guido Preparata, who's an economist, but his father was Giuliano Preparata. I don't know if you know him. No. He was a physicist. And he, before he died, was working on uh and he got he got kind of he got shut down by the community for, for talking smack to to uh what's his name? Richard Feynman. <laughs> oh, well, yeah, you don't want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> he told him he was full of it, and that, that was the end of his grant money. But uh, oh, but God. he was working on structure on the structure of water and the memory of water, oh. thinking that that was actually not only better for farming and stuff like this, but also that it could possibly heal cancer. You know, and uh, and I, there are people who've been doing this. In fact, I talked to someone on my podcast a couple weeks ago, Dr. Ken Thorpe. He's a he's a physician radiologist and he his all he kind of independently came to, to some understanding of this as well so i think there's a big difference in the you know there's and this is talking quality right this is the qualities and mm. going back to my my natural science classes in college you know i remember we had to draw something i can't remember what it was and i was i was doing it in color and the, my professor says you don't need color we don't do color i said what do you want that's why Color is quality, right? We, and that was didn't matter to to the to the to the observation. And I remember, mm. you know, being of a poetic disposition. Oh yes, it does, <laughs> you know. But I think but this is what we're talking about with qualities, and not only the quality. So in Goethe and, and with Hauschka's idea of thinking into a thing, I mean, part of the thinking into a thing is as you're present to it, is being. And you can't, you, it doesn't just happen like one time. You can't just go, okay, make it happen. Mm -hmm. it, it really transpires over time. But, mm -hmm. and, and, and I, I call it this kind of uh, contemplative disposition toward the phenomenon, which allows it to speak. But what happens in that, that conversation is you, I, like you would use the word intuition earlier, right? But you get feelings and other kinds of insights in, in, through the course of doing this. Um, and I think that is the realm of quality and our, from, you know, our, our culture, I mean, gosh, I mean, just think of the technocracy. We, we live in the reign of quantity, right? So everything has got to be measured and, you know, like that, remember that song, mm -hmm. Wicked Messenger by Bob Dylan? Mm -hmm. I met a wicked messenger from, from shallow he did come, who's with the mind that could divide the smallest matter. Right. Mm. And uh, but I think coming to the qualities of and this is uh, with, interesting with Goethe, who was a poet mm -hmm. and was approaching science at, with a poetic soul. And he hated Newton because he, he called it the, the mechanical dogmatic torture chamber, mm -hmm. empirical dogmatic torture chamber that uh, that that wants to torture plants or whatever mm -hmm. to find out you know, we as you know the great line from wordsworth you know we murder to dissect right so and and i know this is a teacher when i was i was a school teacher for 16 years and uh there's a big difference from you know with the children i would i would teach you know they would you know watch the nature channel a hundred times and they've seen all the stuff about snakes or whatever you know, but you take them on a camping trip and they actually see an actual snake in the world. It's a qualitatively different experience. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's one of the reasons I think it, it seems like such a categorical error that when, they, when they're talking about consciousness, they divide the qualia from the quantitative, from the matter. Uh -huh. Because a scientist, even when he's just doing rigidly empirical science, still has to be concerned with quality. He may not, he may not concern himself with the qualia, with the, the, the visual impact of blue or something like that. But if he's uh -huh. doing an experiment about something, it's, he's either doing it well or badly. That's a quality issue, isn't it? I mean, 
Mm. Quality seems to come into everything. I don't see how you can erase quality from any part of life. And and uh, well, anyway, that was a side note. I'm sorry. No, it's I good. I mean, I I, I I think this is one of those topics that like if the three of us have some sense of it, we can talk about it with each other and we can be like, yeah, yeah, I know what you're talking about. And then it's, but if you don't have that sense of what you're, you know, what, what is Karen talking about when she says quality? I, I, I would just, I, I personally would like to have some, you know, some way to bring some more people in to the, uh, to the discussion. And like Michael, you said, I think the things with the water that, that are not present in the, in the city versus the, the, the well water, it has to do with the qualities. And so I wanted to press you on that a bit because it got me thinking. So if I have this picture, right, and I can say, um, and you might say, well, anything, anything that's not in that picture could be a quality. So for example, maybe the water, uh, you know, can, can convey some kind of an electromagnetic uh, uh, vibration or message or something like that. That's not in this picture, right? So that right. could be a quality. And I hadn't really thought about that before that quality could be, could be, when you said it, I was thinking could be all the things that are, are never captured in your model and are never captured in your, um, well, in your instruments, speaking as a scientist, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. I mean, I, I just want to throw that back at you because you, you made me think of that when you, when you made that comment. Well, it, well, it, you know, in fact, I remember this one time, gosh, probably 30 years ago, my, my wife and I were visiting Botanical Garden someplace in, in Michigan here. And a um, woman, I don't know if she was a scientist or who she was, I think she was a scientist. She was out there doing something with the plants that I think she was fertilizing. Hmm. And I said, well, and I just engaged her in conversation and I said, do you use organic fertilizers or do you use chemical? Oh, these are chemical. I said, why do you use those rather than something that's based in nature? He goes, well, plants don't know the difference. <laughs> and uh, I beg to differ. Um, oh. But I think, I mean, when we talk about the qualities, so, if, and I, I think if you were to compare city water to well water or spring water, right? Well, it's not just water that's in there, right? Right. And there's all, all those other things are part of the the quality of the water, so you can't you can't say they're the same. Um, it reminds me of another story. I love this story. Uh, Aaron Fried Pfeiffer, who was kind of he was a scientist who was the guy who really got biodynamic farming off the ground, mm -hmm. and he actually he had this thing in the the fifties, I think, and yeah, the fifties and early sixties in the United States, where he was he had what's called a uh, compost starter so he and he was using it with mu municipalities with their with their trash mm -hmm. and they would turn trash into high quality compost in like 30 days wow and a lot of municipalities were doing this they, but they discontinued it for whatever reason um so he was he was transforming probably because it lets off methane no it had nothing to do with that i think it had to do with who was making money from it Oh, <laughs> um, I think DuPont got wind of it or something. But anyway, what, what happened? It, he had a, an experimental station, and I it, it was in Pennsylvania, I believe, maybe New York. And somebody gave him some seed, uh, some wheat seed that they had found that was taken from uh, one of the two, one of the pyramids. Oh no way! We wow. so got a handful of this, and so he would germinate. He was doing it all in a greenhouse, you know until he had enough to plant a whole field right so it took him a couple of few seasons till he had enough seed to try a you know, plot and when he finally did move it out of the greenhouse and, and into the field he couldn't he he couldn't have any success with it because as soon as the the, the seeds formed and the heads formed and ripened crows came from miles away they would skip everybody else's field and go right to this stuff so the crows apparently felt that there was a difference in the quality. Yeah. And I, and I think we, we can see that right now. Well, I think with GMOs, for instance, I always tell my students, you know, just doing, I said, it looks like, it looks like a plant. Is it? <laughs> if it's got mm -hmm. DNA from something like a spider or something in there, is it still qualifies a tomato or, or corn or whatever? Yeah. Right. And 
I mean, talk about qualities, right? And 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 I think one of the things that I, I read this yeah, not too long ago. You know, a lot of people have celiac disease nowadays. And how did that happen when the human species has been eating wheat for thousands and thousands of years? You know, it's it's a, it's a question worth asking. And we, right. and we do, it's not a question that gets asked very often. What changed? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, can, can we go back to the water thing for just a second? Sure. So if you just take, if you have, let's just take water that's just water. I mean, well, it's never just water because there's also <laughs> always a certain amount of minerals involved in water. And I suppose in all water, there's a different proportion of those minerals, depending mm -hmm. on where it comes from. But if you took two, you know, spring water for, or water from your well, Michael, that's, um, that's so pure that you don't need to filter it. And you've got, you've got two vats of that water. And one of them you do, is it cymatics where they run, where they run um, vibrations underneath the yeah. water and, and it makes these beautiful designs? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's say that you you do that with I don't know Bach or Mozart or something under one vat of water for a while, and you don't do it under the un, under the other vat of water. Do they act differently in the way that they add nutrients to plants, or in the way that they provide health for animals or anything? I, it seems to me I've heard something about that that that. Um, in fact, you mentioned something, Michael Martin, about um, you mentioned something about some guy with living some kind of living water. water. Well, I mean, there's, um, there's well, more no, than there, one there meaning was, of living water. A, I mean, you mentioned some some uh, experimenter that had been today. Working. Today, yes, today. Uh, well, no, yeah, I did with my uh, my friend, Dr. Ken Thorpe. And so he's been doing some kind of research with structured water in that way. But um, so, so what, what I was thinking with um, regard to what you were just saying, you see, where were you talking about water? Um, I lost it. I lost it. Well, <laughs> do, Don't do come the, back. Do the, do, do musical vibrations or vibrations that oh, yeah. Here's patterns the thing. Here's in the water, does that affect the quality of the water? I, yes, I think, I think it probably does. But here's what I... So in homeopathy, for instance, that how they make remedies in homeopathy is by triturating in water. And the, and the, the idea in homeopathy is that if you take the the physical substance and reduce it to its you know as condensed as you can get that the spiritual part of the substance becomes stronger so you have this little tiny you, you know micro dose of whatever it happens to be that but because you you produce the physical and this is this is straight up 17th century alchemy um, because you've reduced the physical to, to its minimum, you've maximized the spiritual part of, of, the, of whatever the substance happens to be, which gives it, which is how it achieves its effects. That's the idea. And so talking about how the qualities are different now, um, a I think he was, they were colleagues of Hauschka. They definitely knew each other. They were uh, Eugene and Lily Kalisko. Hmm. And they were doing experiments with, uh, what do they call it? Crystallography. And it was inspired by, I think Rudolf Steiner told them, he said, you ever noticed how, uh, now you don't see this too much these days, but with old fashioned windows in the 19th and early 20th century, Steiner said to him, you ever notice how the crystals that form on the glass at a butcher shop are different than the crystals that form in a glass on a, on a flower shop? You should figure out why that is. <laughs> you mean talking like in, in the winter time, the ice yeah. crystal? Yeah, 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 yeah. You should find out what that is. <laughs> and they started to do experiments with that. Yeah. Did they figure it out? That yeah, I I gave the book to a friend of mine years ago. It's called Oh Great. <laughs> it's called uh, the Agriculture of Tomorrow, where they were doing they were conducting these kinds of experiments at different times of the year and in different places to to see um 
how things would would crystallize, you know, mm -hmm. and what kind of crystals would form. In fact, one of the things they did, because in biodynamic farming, one of the things you do, as I mentioned with the horn manure, is you bury it in the earth over the winter months. Mm -hmm. Well, and and then actually the quartz one, you, you bury it over the summer months. But how how is how are things different under the earth? I mean, this is only, this is not feet, this is only about a couple of feet deep. How are things different in the earth at those temp different times of the year? I mean, we know they are on the surface, but is, is there anything different on the inside? And they actually, well, by using these methods, they do something qualitatively different. Well, certainly the, this idea just came into my head, so it's very ill-formed, but um, <clears throat> this morning I got a, an email from Michael Levin recommending a couple of people to me saying, you should talk to these people, contact mm -hmm. them, and I'll tell them that you're going to contact them. And one of them is a, a, a woman who is both an MD and an epidemiological uh, biologist. <clears throat> And her name is Anna Soto, A-N-A-S-O-T-O. -O. So I was listening to Anna Soto lectures today <clears throat> and she and her colleagues are trying to write a new paradigm for biological, a new biological kind of theoretical construct um, mm -hmm. because she said materialism in biology is dead and um, biology does not reduce to physics and chemistry. And so she started listing these elements that have to be part of this new theoretical paradigm. And I was really struck by it because they line up exactly with what I've been saying are the paradigm of art, of the process of creating art, designing, um, constraints, context, variability, and I, I can't remember some of the others, but but they're all in there. And on this issue of constraints, I'm thinking about, now let's go back to these things that are buried during the winter months. Definitely have different constraints than things that are buried during the summer months because the, the soil expands when the, uh -huh. when the ice crystals are beginning to form in the soil and are putting a different- Oh, when they did the experiments, they buried them lower. But these experiments were under the frost line. Under the frost line. Yeah. Well, I don't well, care. The frost line <laughs> is still expanding downward. I mean, you, you're still changing the context and you're changing the constraints that are around that object. And right, uh, yeah. which is the whole point, right? Yeah. Because it is different. Yeah. Yeah. It is different. You know, I, we, I think, we, you know, we all know that with seasonal affective disorder, right? Mm -hmm. right. It used to people it used to be a, a figment of people's imaginations, and until we had a clinical term for it, right? Well, and the other thing she's talking about with like biological constraints, you can take the same. If you take, and I, I can't remember all of it because I just watched the lecture, but let's say something that in a in a certain uh, viscosity of biological material will become a neuron if you change the viscosity uh, or you put it uh, near very stiff muscles it becomes something else yeah. the same cell can either be a right. neuron or it can be so it depends yeah. on the context okay. and the constraints right. that are, that are surrounding the thing That's as good. what it yeah. becomes yeah that is good that is good and then inherent in life is that ability to go either way, that it, that it has, mm -hmm. in its unmanifest level, it has all those possibilities. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah. And and she also says that there's a certain agential, there's a certain agency in all of that. Um, she jumped up a right? few levels and she showed a goat that was born with their, their um, she says their anterior limbs, the front legs were paralyzed. When the when the goat was born and mm -hmm. so that goat learned to walk on its hind legs on its own so it walks around on its hind legs just like a human being yeah. because or um biological organisms have 
the capacity to kind of make decisions. Yeah. She calls well, them they're... normative. They have the capacity to make their own choices about things. And there's there's this other thing too I should bring up. Now this comes from Goethe again. You know, I, and it's a question I ask my, my students in philosophy courses. I say, you know, philosophy, I just tell them, philosophy is just asking what seem to be really dumb questions. Oh, that I would be good at that. After I you know. think about it, they're not so dumb. <laughs> And I and I and this is one of the ones that uh, Goethe proposed. Why do Why do we have eyes? I mean, because if you go in, you, get, you go into caves, right, where salamanders and fish live in caves, they don't have eyes. You know, they have atrophy. Why do we have eyes? And Goethe's conclusion was, our eye was created by light. Yeah. You know, so how? <laughs> <laughs> How is the that's the million dollar question, right? Yeah, that's good. Which speaks to exactly what you were just describing, Karen, right? The conditions or the constraints. Oh, oh, I see what you're saying. Okay, yeah. the constraints. Yeah, yeah. Well, I got derailed there for a second because when you said, "Why do we have eyes?" I was remembering Anna Soto's lecture where she was using the example of a tick, because a tick apparently doesn't have eyes but it um it is able to find its victim because of the smell of the skin or or of the fur and gravity allows it to fall from the tree into the fur and then once it's there it has the capacity kind of a homeostatic capacity to move towards warmth so it can move towards the warmth of the body and get closer to the body and then stick its head in the body. And it does all that without eyes and without a lot of other senses. But it has these highly refined senses of what. But but that says to me, and I, these things are so hard to put into words, but it says to me that there's something more than just the constraints that it was in. It's more like, well, that capacity in my simplistic mind, that capacity is a gift from the creator so that the tick has has what it needs to do what it's going to do. And we have eyes because we need to have eyes for what we are called to do. And um, yes, there is probably some way in which light is a constraint or a lack of constraints that that has something to do with the development of eyes, but I just can't see how this stuff is just one, one direction. It's just all natural processes moving in one direction towards some goal without it also coming from the other direction. Seems to me there has to be that transcendent move downward and then the, the immanentization upward. <laughs> I would completely agree. I, I can't make sense of the world otherwise. And uh, I wonder sometimes, you know, and I, whether that's education or whether, you, whether some of us come here with that, with that knowledge already in us or some of us don't forget it. I mean, I really wonder sometimes because I, I uh, yeah, I can also cannot, I cannot look at the natural world and, and see it only a movement from matter becoming more whatever, mm -hmm. you know. It just it doesn't work for me, but I can't prove that to anybody. Mm -hmm. uh, but I I meet wonderful people who also are like, oh yeah, I know what you mean. <laughs> like, how do you know? How do you also know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Reminds me of your Terrence McKenna's <laughs> great one-liner that uh, materialistic science is, is is like just give us one miracle. And we'll explain everything else in the big, we'll the take it the big there, bang. Right. <laughs> yes, it was the big bang, right? With everything, with all the laws and all the matter and all the energy, and then we'll take it from there. Yeah. Well, I, I think it was Hawking who said, just give me gravity and I can give you a universe. But I mean, oh, he's he still needs gravity. <laughs> right. He still needs you know, gravity. and nobody even knows what gravity is. So so, so okay. Michael Claridge, I still want you to go back and explain that experiment you did with ink. Yes, I certainly will. Yeah. And light, because I think that fits in right here with the whole idea of light. I'm seeing what time it is. So what happened was I was uh, uh, cleaning up an accidental ink spill, and I use I use um, 
ink fountain pens with you know with with ink that you have to buy and and I was clean, cleaning it up and I used a lot of water yeah. it wasn't a big spill and I noticed that the ink that I was using that 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 the ink had moved through the paper the towel in such a way to separate out into different colors and I was like that's very cool because I didn't I thought my ink was just I don't know a single pig I hadn't thought about it I thought my ink was just a single pigment pigment but clearly it wasn't a single pigment because there was the browns kind of stayed close to where the spill was and then these reds kind of went out from there and then the yellows went out further from there it's quite lovely quite lovely and I was kind of sitting there kind of just musing at the beauty of it and then something in me clicked and said there it's all going in only in one direction the, the yellow is flowing away from the window. And I was like, oh, I wonder if that's just an accident or something. So I cleaned everything up and then did some, you know, put the paper towel facing in different directions. And still, when you put a little ink on, <clears throat> it would separate and the reds would, the darkest would stay kind of where you put the ink and the reds would pull away from the window and then the yellows would pull away farther from the window. And it's just, you know, I, I have a lot more work to do on it if I'm going to. Well, go you also anywhere. you also changed the level, right? Just in case there was a slope on the table. Exactly. So you sloped I, I put, it two different yeah, ways. I sloped it two different ways and that didn't make any difference. Hmm. And I tried it with an artificial light and and that also it, it moved away. I mean, these are things that have to be repeated many times mm -hmm. if before, you know, but I was so excited, I, I put it in my Substack because I was kind of like, "Look at That's this! Cool. This is very well, cool." You know, I'm I'm going to harp on Goethe again. Yeah. So, and this is a I used to dem do this demonstration with college students in this one class I taught, and I do it with el elementary age students as well. So, his criticism of Newton's theory of color was that you know, and I and I always say to the kids, I said, "So, uh, where does color come from? It's when light." White light is broken into its constituent parts, right? It's, di it's dissected light. And Goethe didn't like that idea. And when he was, he was alive, you know, prisms were extraordinarily expensive. You didn't just go buy a prism. Yeah, right. So he knew an, uh, a wealthy nobleman in, in Germany who had a box of prisms and, wow. and he borrowed them. You know, and the guy said, well, you'll have to get back in two weeks. I'll send my man over. He'll pick him up in two weeks. And Goethe got busy doing other stuff forgot to do anything with them. And the guy comes to the door. My master wants his, his prisms. He goes, oh yeah, hold on. And he just, on the way to the door, he picks up the prism and he doesn't hold it in the light like you're, mm -hmm. you're taught to in school. He mm -hmm. puts it up to his eye and he looks around the room and he says, no, forget it. Tell him, come back in two more weeks. <laughs> because what he saw around like a window, uh, he if there was this, this is one pane square window, he saw, say on the on the left side and on the bottom, he saw at the edges were like blue and green. And at the other edges, he saw orange and yellow. Orange and, okay. and he wanted to figure out why this was. So unlike uh, Newton's theory that white color is it arises at the, when light is broken into its constituent parts, Goethe, his his conclusion was more poetic. He, he said, and I think he's right, and I think this is what you saw, that color arises at the interplay between light and darkness. And you can see this in the in the sky right now. It's four thirty here, cloudy though. So very often, if, if you look, so you have a, like a reddish orange sunset. Mm -hmm. Well, if you look to the opposite side of the sky, you'll see yeah. the opposite part of the prism. You'll see right? the opposite part of the yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and if you if you zoom out a, away from the Earth, imagine looking down on the Earth. There's really just one sunset. It's where the shadow is, and then your part of the Earth is spinning mm -hmm. underneath that shadow point, which is just what you're saying between light and dark. You're spinning. Your part of the Earth's surface is spinning right underneath that dividing mm -hmm. line between light and dark and you call it sunset yeah and he in other words a demonstration in which i would he, he did similar to what you did so just with a simple thing with a i would do it with a flashlight and then put one sheet in front of the in front of the flashlight and the more sheets you add of white paper it becomes redder and redder 
mm -hmm. right? Which is why, you know, we know that when we see a red sunset, it's because of, of disturbances in the atmosphere between the viewer and the sun, right? So you see all that stuff in between turns red. But the other side, he, he concluded that when you see blue, like when, when you ask, why is the sky blue? Because that's, and he did a demonstration of this with a tank of water and a, a light in front of the water, water, and we have darkness behind the water, the tank, and the water takes on a blue color. And so he just did kind of very simple demonstrations like that. And like you said earlier, Michael, right, where uh, he didn't want to use apparatus to get in between yeah. the, the viewer and the phenomenon, right? Yeah. And just to see what lived there, and maybe maybe go to the apparatus after you you've done the actual experience. Yeah, and and if your apparatus, if your if your apparatus dissects whatever it's looking at, then it will tell you what happens when you dissect the thing, right? Yeah. But that's a very big leap then to say, oh well, now I know what color is. Mm -hmm. No, you know what dissected light is, right? Mm -hmm. But then to say you know what color is, that's a that's a you, you haven't yet done that. Right. Well, and the interesting thing, whether you're doing an experiment with a piece of equipment or without a piece of equipment, in either case, you're still making an interpretation. The scientist always has to be making an interpretation. I don't see how you can ever take that out of the equation because no, you can't. Because and then you kind of abstract it and then uh, uh, um, uh, more and more useful interpretations become scientific models. And so then the scientific model gets taught to all the students, and that becomes the framework in which all the students think. And this, I'm just right. describing how education works, right? That but, is. It's, um, but it's very, very obvious in science uh, that models of reality get taught as reality. Uh, and I think it does a number on us. It kind of uh, inverts our experience sometimes of the world. And then we're not really doing science, right? Correct. Yeah. Right. I and mean, that's it's an interesting thing about it is it becomes dogma. You bet. Yeah. And you get run out of town if you if you challenge the dogma. And that's the history of science too, right? It's the history of science. There <laughs> be this one guy, you know what? I don't think that's a good idea. You're out. Exactly. You're out. Yeah. And then 20, 20, 30 years later, you know, I think that crazy guy was right. Mm -hmm. do, well, do you think we're turning a little bit of a corner? I mean, I was certainly encouraged when I saw this material by Anna Soto, who is a, yeah. um, a well-respected researcher. And um, yeah. she's not she's not bringing God into the mix at all. But she is saying that te that biology must function teleologically there's no yeah. other way for it to function now she finds a way to find the teleology built into the the necessary inner workings of this system that's defined by constraints and variability and novelty and, and all of that mm -hmm. but um but she still recognizes that they have to talk about teleology which is something they haven't talked about for oh, i don't know mm -hmm. what 100 years yeah you got um, it right. can't talk about so that. So I see a little bit of hope there and uh, and certainly meeting two gentlemen like you who both have wonderful bona fides. Have you both gotten run out of town? <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, I have. I have. Yes. Well, I'm not uh, a scientist. That's, <laughs> that's Well, it sounds like, Michael, from what little I've been able to read and see of your work, that you're there's some element I was just speaking roughly on the religious side of what what can we do to to bring back some life to these things which are incredible but have become ossified maybe or have have, have lost some of their life and I have the same I have very much the same mission in in, sci in the world of science yeah science has become almost useless to the human soul we're very good at making mRNA vaccines but you know what are we doing to 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 develop the soul right that's right and 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 that's why like i wouldn't say things are about to turn the corner but there are glimmers of hope out there like i i mentioned my friend uh dr ken thorpe and um other people doing interesting like brian josephson 
has been talking about stuff like this for a long time. Um, so it's, and, you know, so the reason I got, I get interested in uh, physics is when I was in working my master's degree, I was trying, I want, wanted to write my thesis on creativity. And how does it, how does it happen? How does it arise? And uh, I don't, I started, I had a couple of books on fractals. And then I went from there to David Bohm, you know, and his book, uh, The Undivided Universe. When he, and, it went, and I think this is, in, to me, this is, was revolutionary, the way I could see the world, his idea of implicate order, that, you know, the world, the cosmos is implicit in us, and we are implicit in the co cosmos. So, which is what, which is kind of the mechanism, I hate to use that word, it's the wrong word, but that's the way by which we can say that intuition works, or this revel, we're talking about this phenomenal logical reduction where the thing reveals itself to us. I think that's how it happens because, you know, and this goes back to the, you know, Heisenberg, right? There's no such thing as an impartial observer. You're part of the experiment. Mm -hmm. and I think it's important. And I think that's, you know, it would be interesting. I, what's his name? Rupert Sheldrake. I saw an interview with him once. And he said, well, you know, science was one thing to a hundred years ago. It's a different thing now, and don't think it's going to stay like this. Eventually, it's going to be something different in another hundred years. Yeah. Well, I'm frightened by uh, you know these cycles. I, what I can tell, these cycles humanity goes through of, of plunging more into matter or maybe more into spirit. And uh, boy, it sure feels like we are. There's 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 a big wave of pushing us everybody into this world of pure matter pure all that matters is matter pure matter let's mess with the matter and mm -hmm. and it, it i feel it like on a daily basis i'm sure others yeah. do too and it's like no you know we there, there's we can't, we can't go we can't go that that way again right let's not do that again mm -hmm, uh, right. but it, it feels like it's it's very imminent and it scares me it is. Well, if you get a chance, Michael Claridge, you could watch uh, Jordan Peterson's lecture, which is called The Logos at Ephesus, mm. um, okay. which is kind of a, it's a, like a one and a half hour lecture that takes all of his thought over the last 30 years and compiles it wow. into one essence. Whoa. And the bottom line of what he's saying there is that meaning precedes matter. And well, if, if, yeah. if we could just make that the mantra of the yeah. world, <laughs> that would make a big difference in science, that meaning <laughs> precedes matter. Yeah. And um, fortunately, he has a larger audience base and... The problem is he he says a lot of big words in an hour and a half and it takes a while to boil it down into <laughs> this idea that meaning precedes matter but um i have a simple mind so i usually boil it down and uh yeah, yeah. I and think the notion that, that somehow science should not concern itself with meaning is absurd mm -hmm. that is like who who ever said that what idiot ever said that and I, I get into these arguments with fellow scientists like no you have to you have to pull your sense of meaning out of the and i'm like no no we have to put more of it into it you know that's uh yeah i would yeah i just had a conversation the other day with a young software developer and he said he has these conversations all the time with his software developer colleagues yeah. that they they say you've got to get the meaning out of here you know just logic 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 and he says no you, there's no way we can even talk to each other about our projects at that level of just um logic we have to move up a level into the level of the story of what it is we're trying to accomplish in order to even communicate with each other yes so um so what is that what is that i think karen you and i might have approached this question last time we talked like what is that in us that put wants to push us towards that logic only matter only i mean who said why why why, why you well, well you probably haven't read mcgilchrist right i don't know he and, Ma no. he and mcgilchrist um, okay. 
has well, written. This is this is the this. I mean, this was, goes back. This is what Goethe was fighting against. You ever ever see the movie Time Bandits? Oh, long ago. Yeah. In it, well, in there in Time Bandits, it's there's the the supreme being who's basically this kind of English gardener, you know, gentleman gardener, an elderly mm-hmm. man, and there's the evil genius. The devil and the, the the evil genius is obsessed with technology and VCR and how to program things and computers, mm-hmm. and and he that he just wants everything to be you know quantified and be be able to control and and uh, he's also responsible and, and I tell students when they talk about you know the salvation of science I say well hold on hold on what are the biggest problems on the earth right now and they'll say pollution other things right i say well these, these are all we're all created by science mm-hmm. <laughs> right and it's in, in, in david bohm's uh, opinion that's because scientists for generations have have uh, uh, taken up the assumption that they are uh, disinterested observers but they're not part of the experiment so mm-hmm. they'll create fukushima and say isn't this a great thing yeah. and fukushima Fukushima blows up and, and they have to figure out another great invention to fix the problems from the last great invention, right? Yeah, and right. So the question is, what would happen if we, we had a science, and this is what I've asked in my books, if we had a science that w- would bring meaning back, mm-hmm. uh, it would be a more human science and it would be, I think, a, a, a more liberated science and liberating as well. So th- that comes, I only have, I have nine more minutes. Uh, that, I was pondering on that before our talk here the last, this last week. And, you know, I, I think it seems to me that people like us, the three of us, have to be talking about this, wondering about it, meeting other people, keeping that alive, but that none of us is going to invent that science that has more meaning. That right. that is something that literally has to come from from a higher level of meaning, uh, or maybe one of us will be inspired by some muse level event, right? <laughs> mm-hmm. um, but we're not going to get there by. It's, it's a strange feeling. I feel sometimes like we're not going to get there by talking about it, but we have to keep talking about it to keep to keep our antennas open to it. If that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, it's gotta yeah, it's gotta stay, it's gotta be, it's gotta filter into the consciousness of the race <laughs> in a way. Mm-hmm. You know, if you and it's in uh well, for instance, so I've been writing about this stuff and John Milbank, the the English theologian and philosopher, he, this is what he talks about the alternate alternate alternative mon- modernity, right? Because there is this uh, stream that you see in Hauschka and you see in Steiner, you see in Goethe, that is not the mainstreams of science, but it's it's it hasn't gone away either. No, it has not gone away. Yeah, so that there's something important in that, and and who knows? Who knows what the conditions will, will need to be to to uh, to to make the sciences a little more human? Yeah. But I think it's possible. Well, we need to keep speaking the truth because that's certainly part of the part of the problem. Um, my mouse is still not working, so <laughs> I'm going to have to ask one of you guys to to close us out. And um, well, maybe I, we won't be able to do that. I'm not going to be able to hit the end button on this um, oh. meeting. Well, you can just shut your computer down. Yes, that's what I'm going to have to do, and okay. hopefully, I won't. Hopefully, I won't lose this file because yeah. neither one of you were recording either, right? No, I hope not. Yeah, I might just leave the whole thing on and open until my husband gets home and finds me another mouse. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. So anyway, this has been absolutely delightful. I appreciate you guys giving me so much time, and uh, and I I'm hoping that maybe some scientists out there will catch fire from this and. Hope so. Nice Find to meet you, Michael. Forward. Yeah, good to meet you too, Michael. Yeah, right. I think we should we should probably do this again, like in several months. We should. Yeah, that would be nice. super fun. By that time, I will have absorbed Anna Soto and maybe had an opportunity to oh, talk to her. Good. You and can, you yeah, find you your mouse can. mouse by then too. Yeah, and I might <laughs> be able to get Anna Soto in on this and make it a foursome. That would, yeah. that would okay. be super fun. That would be yeah. good. Let's do that. Okay. Okay. Thanks, guys. All right. Thanks, thanks a lot. Yeah. Bye.